You're listening to episode number 27 of the Fed and Fearless podcast. Today, I'm chatting with Nicole Jardim all about how to fix your period. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Laura Schoenfeld. I'm a registered dietitian and coach trained in functional medicine with a passion for helping women just like you ditch perfectionism and use food, fitness, and self-care to fuel your bigger God-given purpose. I believe that it's possible to achieve your biggest life-changing goals without the frustration, obsession, or negative self-talk that so many women subject themselves to every day. All you need are the right tools, the right mindset, and the faith to turn your dreams into reality. I'm here to guide you along the way. The truth is that you are so much more than a body, and I'm on a mission to help you change the way you think and act at a core beliefs level so you can transform your physical, mental, and spiritual health from the inside out. Are you ready to become fed and fearless in your pursuit of a healthy, meaningful life? Welcome to the Fed and Fearless Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld, your host as always, and I have another amazing guest for you all today. Um, She's someone that I met in person, I think like two years ago at this point, and she is so sweet and so knowledgeable and just really inspirational when it comes to the world of women's health and periods, which is always such a fun topic to talk about, right? So I'm super excited to have with me today, Nicole Jardim. Nicole is a certified women's health coach and the creator of Fix Your Period, a series of programs that empower women to reclaim their hormone health using a method that combines simplicity and sass. Her incredible work has impacted the lives of tens of thousands of women around the world in effectively addressing a wide variety of period problems, including PMS, irregular periods, PCOS, painful and heavy periods, missing periods, and many more. Rather than treating problems or symptoms, Nicole treats women by addressing the root cause of what's really going on in their bodies and minds. She passionately believes that the fundamentals to healing any hormonal imbalance lie in an approach that addresses the unique physiology of every woman. This is essential to reclaiming and maintaining optimal health and vitality at any age. Nicole is the author of her brand new book, Fix Your Period, Six Weeks to Banish Bloating, Conquer Cramps, Manage Moodiness, and Ignite Lasting Hormone Balance. She's also the co-author of The Happy Balance, a recipe book filled with over 80 hormone balancing recipes. Finally, she's the co-host of The Period Party, a top-rated podcast on iTunes. And she's the creator of the Institute for Integrative Nutrition's Hormone Health Continuing Education course. Like I said, Nicole has so much to offer, so much knowledge and experience, and I had so much fun talking with her on the episode today. So without further ado, here is Nicole Jardim. All right, everybody. I am so excited to have with me on the show today, Nicole Jardim. Hey, Nicole, how are you doing? Hi, Laura. I'm so happy to be here. I'm doing really good. Thank you for asking. Yeah, well, I know you got a lot of big stuff happening with your business and your mission in general that I'm excited to chat with you about today. And for anyone who isn't familiar with you and the work that you do, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became known as the period girl. I know it's kind of a self-imposed name. (laughs) Um, I am a certified women's health coach and my focus has always been on helping women fix their periods. And for the longest time as a teenager into my early twenties, I had the most excruciating periods. And so for me, it's a very personal story. And I really, because I really, really struggled. So back when I was about 14, 15, I started to get these really heavy kind of crazy periods. I started to get all this pain and it seemed to kind of come out of nowhere. And that went on for a number of years. And my mom had really terrible periods. So she just sort of assumed that this was your lot in life. This is what you got. (laughs) It didn't matter that, you know, you were dying basically every month, but, um, 
eventually what started to happen was my periods would come every three or four months. And that was really strange. My mom didn't think that was normal. So finally I went and saw my gynecologist or her gynecologist and she immediately wrote me a prescription for the pill and suggested that I start taking it immediately because that would be the thing that would regulate my cycle. I would start having less heavy periods. I would start having less pain, all the things that I needed solutions to desperately. And within a month of being on the pill, I had, I had really started to see a major difference. I truly felt like I'd found my silver bullet, my period panacea, you know, this was my answer. And finally, you know, I was, I was in a place to, you know, have my life back. All of my friends were on the pill too. So I was like, now with a cool kids club, (laughs) It it was a big deal. So fast forward a couple of years of being on this pill, I, you know, the, my luck started to turn and I started noticing that my hair was falling out more and I started to develop this melasma all over my face. And everyone kept saying to me, Oh, well, that's only supposed to happen when pregnant women. And that's very strange. It's happening to you. You're only 21, you know, that kind of thing. You know, it's just the stuff that people tell you to make you even more insecure about what's happening to you. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I started having chronic UTIs and yeast infections and I had horrible gut health issues, terrible joint pain to the point where walking down the stairs was really hard. All of these symptoms were coming up. I was seeing so many different doctors. You know, my gynecologist was like a revolving door because I was constantly getting medication for the yeast infections and the UTIs. And finally, my last straw was getting medication for UTI and being allergic to it and ending up in the ER, like, you know, bright red, uh, from head to toe, crazy fever. And, um, and I was like, okay, that's it. I'm done now. I can't do this anymore. It's been too many years of this craziness. And I, on a whim, I went and saw a friend's acupuncturist and immediately he started to talk to me about the birth control pill and how, in his words, that is not a natural thing to do. And I, you know, at the time I thought, oh gosh, this guy's crazy. But eventually he wore me down and I came off the pill. I was doing acupuncture consistently and I was changing my diet on his recommendation. I went to Whole Foods for the first time. You know, it was just a whole new world. And that was really sort of like the catalyst for doing the work that I do, because I realized that I could have a period that wasn't ruining my life and it was no big deal every month. And I thought, well, wow, I know a lot of people who also struggle with this kind of stuff. Maybe I can help them. And it just ended up being like a 10 year odyssey trying to get from film production, which is what I had been studying in school and what I did at the time um, to studying to be a health coach and really understanding women's hormones. And so, you know, here I am. Yeah. Well that, like you said, 10 year story into a short period of time, I feel like you were, did a really great job of explaining why you became the period girl, because I think a lot of times, especially in the world of, um, just online coaching in general, a lot of times we, we serve people who were us 10 years ago or us five years ago. So it makes a lot of sense that that is such a big passion for you. So, now that we know what you went through as um, as a younger teen and through your 20s and all of that to get to the place that you are now, um, what would you say are the first signs of a hormonal imbalance that somebody should be looking for to know if they need to explore this journey as well? Yeah, you know, I think that we tend to think of hormonal imbalances as something to do with our menstrual cycles or, you know, something to do with heavy periods, whatever, you know, it's something like that polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, but what I found is that we need to dig a little bit deeper, go a little bit further upstream and, and look at what's happening with what is called our HPA axis. So that's for anyone who doesn't know, and I know your listeners are all very tuned in. So just in case some of you are, um, the HPA axis is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that dictates a whole lot of things going on in your body. And what I found is that, you know, really hormonal imbalances start there. And so this is basically the first line of defense against any kind of stressor for anyone who is unaware of what it does. And as a result, you know, we, we used to call uh, any kind of HPA axis problems, adrenal fatigue, you know, this idea that our adrenals got fatigued and they stopped working properly. And now it has evolved into some Thing known as HPA axis dysfunction or HPA axis maladaptation. And the reason for that is because it's sort of a system wide impact that ongoing stress has on our bodies. And, you know, I think that 
for many of us, we don't really even understand the connection. And I think it's important to know that in non-emergency situations, you know, when your HPA axis is working the way it's supposed to, your cortisol is released. It's released by your adrenal glands and this daily cycle as part of your circadian rhythm, you know, it rises up and then it drops throughout the day and into the evening so that you can go to sleep. And then it works in conjunction with melatonin, which, you know, is a sleepy time hormone and that rises at night and drops in the day. So they work, um, um, on, you know, in a parallel and what happens or in uh, opposition to each other, but what tends to happen for so many of us is that our stress is chronic. Our lives are so full on and this whole perfectly orchestrated pattern begins to shift. And, you know, what I find more than anything, and I know you've seen this a million times in your work too, is that cortisol becomes all dysregulated. We tend to have, you know, either too high cortisol in the morning when we wake up and we're like riddled with anxiety or we, you know, don't have high enough cortisol and, um, and we never really get through the day feeling energetic and feeling like we can actually do it without, you know, huge cups of coffee or sugar or something, you know, lots of refined carbs, things like that. And so coming back to these, you know, these first signs of hormonal imbalance, really what that is, is HPA axis dysfunction, I think. And what we have done in our society, unfortunately, is totally normalize it. So symptoms of this are, you know, difficulty falling or staying asleep. I mean, how many people are prescribed sleeping pills every year? And it's just sort of like a normal part of, of life in the modern world. And, you know, things like um, getting a second wind late at night or feeling really tired, but feeling like you can't fall asleep. And then on the flip side of that, waking up feeling really terrible, you know, you're groggy. And even though you've had a lot of sleep, you still don't feel great. And you have these energy crashes throughout the day, particularly in the mid morning and the mid afternoon. Um, and then also feeling things like hanger <laughs> throughout the day as well. Um, so all of these to me are those first signs, like red alert kind of signs that something is up and that's only going to trickle down, right? Because I, I kind of refer to your, your stress hormones, cortisol, and, and your blood sugar hormone insulin as the, you know, queen bee hormones. And like I said, they have this trickle down effect on other hormones when they become dysregulated. So eventually you start to see other signs of what we traditionally would call hormonal imbalance. Like if you, like we were saying, you know, if there's, um, your period is disappeared or you have a really heavy period or you get serious PMS symptoms or something like that. So that's kind of the, you know, the gist of what I think is something that we need to be looking out for with regard to like imbalanced hormones. Yeah, I totally agree. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why taking the birth control pill can be a bit of an issue for people beyond all the health issues that you were mentioning that you had developed taking the pill for so long. Even if there were no side effects of taking the pill, I feel like your period is such a an indicator of what's going on in your life and if things need to change. And I know even for me personally, as well as a lot of the clients that I work with, sometimes that disruption in the menstrual cycle is really that indicator that, hey, maybe you're too stressed or maybe you need to focus on sleep or maybe you haven't been eating enough or eating appropriately. So I just, I feel like it's that, um, that check engine light that we all have as women that we Oftentimes, if you're, I mean, if you are taking the birth control pill, that light is just, it's like putting duct tape over it and you have no idea if your hormones are going to be getting out of whack or if they would be out of whack if you didn't have that artificial um, hormone influx. Totally. Oh my gosh. I couldn't agree with you more. This idea of masking uh, the symptoms that we're experiencing with, you know, a birth control pill or even another kind of medication. I was just talking to my personal trainer about that this morning about statins and that's way off topic, but, you know, just talking about the fact that those are really just masking underlying problems and we actually just have to deal with the underlying problem. Mm -hmm. So with the adrenal involvement. We know that stress and poor sleep and all the things that get our HPA axis out of whack can drive hormonal imbalances. Is there anything else that you would think somebody might want to be paying attention to? Let's say, I mean, I don't know who out there isn't stressed. If they are, I want to talk to them, but <laughs> I feel like, I feel like most people, if they start to deal with their stress and improve that, is there anything else that you think um, could be a preliminary indicator that the hormones are an issue? 
Yeah. You know, what I found is, you know, I often refer to your menstrual cycle as the canary in the coal mine. And it really, and for anyone who doesn't know about the canary in the coal mine, canaries were taken down into coal mines many, many years ago, and they would die a lot quicker than the coal miners would because they were exposed to these noxious gases and their bodies are a lot smaller. So that was an immediate indicator for people to get out of the coal mine to save their lives. So, you know, what I found is that that some of us, some of our bodies tend to be more like canary in the, canaries in the coal mine than others. I was just talking to a, a client about this, about the fact that, you know, some of us feel like we're so broken and there's something, you know, so wrong with us. And why are we experiencing all of these issues at such a young age? And I remember feeling those that way as well. It was such a struggle for me thinking that, you know, I was 20 years old and I, I felt like a, a 75 year old with the joint pain and the horrible gut issues and, you know, all of these other problems that were cropping up. And and so, you know, I always want to remind people that we all have a, you know, a different threshold for stress and uh, it's important for us to really check in with that or at least become aware of it. And so what I found is for me, for instance, like last year when I've been writing this book, which was really challenging <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, no. Right. Um, what I found or for me at least, or I found over the years is that I start to get lower, lower back pain, that it moves its way up to upper back pain and then neck pain. And then eventually I'm at the point where I'm completely paralyzed. I mean, not paralyzed, but you know, I'm being dramatic, but be, I'm, I feel completely incapacitated and nobody can help except a chiropractor and a massage therapist. And you know, like all the people. So what I found is that that, you know, that lower back pain is definitely where I'm pushing that red zone. And I think that it's really important for us to really get clear on that because like you said, right, nobody is escaping to an Island in the Pacific anytime soon. I mean, maybe some of us are, <laughs> but not all of us. And we need to figure out how to deal with this ongoing chronic stress that exists in all of our lives. And so that's definitely one of the ways to do it is to really pay attention to when you're getting into the red zone, what are those symptoms? So for me, it's lower back pain, but maybe for someone else, it's, you know, a slight headache that eventually will turn into a crazy migraine that's going to, you know, keep them locked in a dark room for two days. So, you know, that's for us really to be checking in with ourselves. And when we're talking about, you know, this HPA axis dysfunction, we have yet another axis called the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, uh, the HPO axis. And of course, all of these axes are intricately connected, right? They're all uh, communicating with each other. I mean, our body is just basically a system within a system within the system. And what I really want to drive home for any of us who are dealing with, uh, you know, this ongoing stress and we don't know how to address it or we don't know how to mitigate the effects of it. When you think about how it impacts your menstrual cycle and why we end up with period problems, it's because of the HPO axis kind of communicating with the HPA axis. And so when we think about the fact that, you know, the two things in common are the hypothalamus and the pituitary with these two axes. And so your hypothalamus and your pituitary are getting all of these signals and inputs from the external world. And they they're of course triggering the adrenals, but they're also triggering the ovaries to do what they do. And so when we think about the hypothalamus, what happens when we have too much cortisol coursing through our veins, it actually dampens the secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone. And so that's the hormone that's responsible for telling your pituitary gland to send FSH and LH to your ovaries to start doing their job of getting a little follicle ready for ovulation. So, you know, by default, lower GnRH possibly means lower FSH, maybe even lower LH. And this will indirectly tell your ovaries to decrease their production of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone over time. And this may slow or stop your menstrual cycle completely, right? It might stop ovulation from happening or it might just delay it. And so this is why this ongoing activation of our body's stress system and you know, these higher levels of the stress-related hormones are directly linked to anovulatory cycles or irregular ovulation, or in some cases, you know, some women will have irregular periods 
uh, or they'll lose their period completely. And others may experience really, really heavy bleeding or bleeding that just doesn't seem to stop. And, you know, this is why I think that it's really critical for women in particular to be really focused on addressing or, you know, like knowing where that stress threshold and really mitigating the effects of stress if they start to get into the red zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I have an online program called Get Your Period Back that is focused on women that have irregular or missing periods. And we talk about the fact that ever all of this is really starting in the brain, like you've been mentioning. And I think so many women want to go in with um, almost more body focused approaches right away, like either the pill or, oh, I'm going to do seed cycling or something like that, that they're just going to focus on that. And they completely ignore the role of the brain in the whole situation. And so I totally agree with you that we need to be looking at the brain first, not that doing stuff to help support the body is bad. It's just, I feel like you're going to be fighting a losing battle if you're trying to do all these things to, um, you know, adjust your hormones from a physical sense and you're ignoring the role that the brain plays. Now, I would love to chat a little bit about hormones in general, because I feel like when we talk about hormones, a lot of women have a negative connotation, just hormones in general. It's like, oh, I'm hormonal today or something like that. And I actually, not to get down a rabbit hole, but I even feel like it's um, a feminist issue to talk about hormones in a way that's not negative, because I think we live in a society that the idea of having hormonal fluctuations is looked at as bad. And so Why do you think that hormones have developed such a bad reputation, not only in general, but especially as disruptors of health and mood? Oh my gosh, I could not agree with you more what you were just saying about, oh, I'm so moody or I'm so PMSy. I remember, you know, years ago uh, when I created my Fix Your Period program, I had asked a lot of women, you know, what comes to mind when you hear the word hormones. And most of them said things similar to what you just said. You know, I I think of hormones, maybe just think of puberty or pregnancy or raging PMS and periods and bad moods or hot flashes and night sweats. You know, nobody really said anything about hormones in a positive way because culturally, as you just mentioned too, uh, we hormones just need a rebrand and the way women's bodies work really need a rebrand. And, um, you know, like when we're talking about like hormones in general, like you said, right, where she's so hormonal, it's the time of the month. Puberty sucks. I can't stop crying. I'm just menopause is a nightmare nightmare. You know, we don't really talk about how our bodies respond to hormones in a positive way whatsoever. And I just think that that reputation certainly needs to shift. And I, you know, when I think about hormones and how critical they are, as you know, Laura, (laughs) to basically every single thing that happens in your body, right? They're these essential chemical messengers. And I, you know, I really, I could almost cry because I feel like we really need to shift the way that we're speaking about them and the way that they show up in our bodies. And so, you know, when, when I think about the fact that, you know, everything is contingent, right? How we respond to stress, how, you know, whether our menstrual cycle works or it doesn't work, um, you know, any of those symptoms that we experience, what's going on with our thyroid, how we digest our food, if we feel hungry or feel we feel happy or sad. I mean, it basically drives everything. And like I said, we need to certainly um, do a little bit of a shift when it comes to this bad rap uh, that, you know, that hormones have. I definitely think it's a cultural thing though. Yeah. I mean, it's, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard usually a man say something like, oh, are you in your period or something? If you're upset about something or if you, you know, have a stronger emotional reaction and it's just, I feel like it's something that makes women think that hormones are better to either suppress or, oh, if you're not getting your period, how awesome. You don't have to deal with that. And I just, I'm very passionate about helping women see the like just importance and power of having healthy balanced hormones that are fluctuating and not looking at it as being like something that's wrong with you or something that's um, undesirable. So I'm so glad that you're on that same page as I knew you would be. (laughs) 
I love that you just said that though, because it's so true, right? Like it really is quite a mindset shift to move away from this cultural paradigm that our bodies are these big mysteries to solve, or there's something to be feared, or that your menstrual cycle is some kind of design flaw. And, you know, and it causes you to act in these ways that are, that don't fit into the cultural narrative of how women should behave. And I really believe that like you just said, we need to, we need to change that up big time. Mm -hmm. Now I will say that if somebody is feeling completely out of control with their emotions during their period, that's not something that they need to just live with. Like you said, (laughs) I think sometimes women will assume that because they've had bad periods growing up, that that means that's just how things are. So I think it would help if we talk about the specific hormones involved, because I know that there's different, um, different symptoms or different problems that can arise depending on which hormones are out of whack. So, um, as far as hormones go, what are the hormones involved with hormonal imbalance and what are some of the symptoms associated with those specific hormones? Yeah. So I think that, you know, coming back, like I said before, with adrenal issues, coming back to the the root cause, um, obviously there's a stress component. We've covered that. But when we're talking about uh, the disruption to your menstrual cycle and those hormones that play a role in your menstrual cycle, you know, we really have to look to ovulation and whether we're actually ovulating or not. And when it comes to something like ovulation, again, we live in a society where we turn off ovulation willy nilly and we don't, you know, we don't really give it even a second thought. And that I think that really needs to change as well. That viewpoint that our, you know, we can just turn this off for 10, 15, 20 years and, you know, it's no big deal, but ovulation is a vital component of our health. And it's a sign of health. And so rather, you know, like rather than thinking of it as this optional thing, I think we really need to start to think of it as, you know, something that is, that plays a really big role in, uh, you know, and bettering our overall health. And so I always kind of say that, you know, we don't really think of, you know, gut health or eyesight as contingent on baby making, obviously, but when we can't see a street sign anymore, or, you know, we have chronic gut health issues, we know there's something wrong. And for whatever reason, if, you know, we're not ovulating, we don't think anything of that. And yet it is such a big contributor to our health. And the reason it is, is because uh, so much of our sex hormone production is contingent on this actual process that happens over the course of, you know, monthly cycle. And so estrogen, progesterone, testosterone in particular are hormones that are produced as a result of the ovulatory cycle. And it's amazing to me because again, like coming back to hormones and their reputation and the fact that they are, you know, they're just sort of seen as these things that cause problems. Um, you know, the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, similarly, you know, we just see those as being responsible for baby making and fertility. And we don't really think think more of it, but yet they have such far reaching effects. I mean, when you think about estrogen and the fact that, you know, it impacts almost every aspect of your health, it impacts your mood. It plays a role in serotonin production. You know, it actually impacts your skin as well and your hair and progesterone plays a role in your bone health. So does estrogen. So does progesterone and in also your brain health. I mean, like there are so many parts um, of, you know, these hormones that we don't really even know about testosterone, and similarly, it's like very much connected to your mood and your sex drive, which, you know, is a necessary part of our health. And yet we, we continually, you know, I was just talking to someone today about this. She was saying, you know, my sex drive, I've really struggled with it. And she's been on the pill for 10 years and nobody ever told her that she's not going to make any testosterone while she's on the pill. And as a result, she would potentially struggle with uh, a depleted libido and she's 28. So I just think that if we really have to come back to the fact that these hormones play such a crucial role, not only in your menstrual cycle and your fertility, but in your overall health. And so when we're talking about menstrual cycle irregularities, uh, you know, it ranges, right? So we've got anywhere from someone who doesn't have a period who would do a program like yours and, or to people who have periods in their 
bleeding, you know, 90 milliliters of blood in one day in their cycle, and which is too much, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, so, you know, it really just runs the gamut. And I always kind of come back to the fact that, you know, some of us may be predisposed to uh, lower levels of these hormones, depending on what's happening with our liver and our gut and our genetics. And some of us might be a little bit more predisposed to the other end of that spectrum. And so, depending on you know what our genetics are doing and what's happening with our gut health and our liver health we might have one symptom or another symptom i tend towards having lower levels of hormones whereas a lot of my clients tend to have you know higher a predisposition to higher estrogen and uh, heavier longer periods so i think it just you know really depends i feel like the root cause is there for everyone it's the same and it just sort of depends on you know how we respond to it and so that's you know that's where really, really where i think people get confused Mm -hmm. And I will say, even for myself, I know over the years I've had issues with um, hormonal imbalance for a variety of reasons. And I I feel like the the circumstances that I'm in will drive a lot of the symptoms that I have. So when I was younger, a lot of times I used to have more of that estrogen dominance type of profile because of low progesterone and a little bit of high estrogen. And these days I feel like a lot of my high estrogen symptoms have totally gone away, which is great. But when I get stressed or, you know, if I have a really busy season of work or anything like that, a lot of times I know for a fact that I don't ovulate because I track that stuff. And then when I don't ovulate, I do find that, okay, my period came on day 45. That's not normal. Or, oh, I'm like feeling really tired lately. Or like, you know, I just feel kind of like blah as far as my mood is concerned. And so like I personally track those signs and symptoms and also just like the actual um, data points that can tell me if I'm ovulating. And not that that solves the problem necessarily, but it does give me so much information about what's going on with my body and what might need to be addressed. And I think it's so important for women to understand how those different types of symptoms, like what actually that means from a physiological perspective. Because I know for me, when I was experiencing high, high estrogen in the, um, I guess kind of earlier twenties, mid twenties, mostly when I was in grad school, big surprise. Um, but I, uh, I would have like really bad, um, cramping and heavy periods, not as heavy as I'm sure other people have had, but definitely heavier flow and, um, more nausea around my first day of my period, that kind of thing. And so, it's, I think it's really important to know what those symptoms mean because even though testing is available and important as well, it gives you like this in-between testing opportunity to kind of identify what's going on and give you some feedback about what might need to happen to make you feel better. Amen to that. Yes. I love that so much. I think that's what it comes down to, right? Is this idea of personalizing your treatment so that, you know, this is not, you're not just taking this one size fits all approach, which tends to be conventional medicines approach and it's fine, you know, whatever we need that too. But I think that the future really is more personalized medicine or personalized treatment so that we're taking into account that person's genetics, their lifestyle, their current situation, their current diet, all of those aspects um, that contribute to your overall health. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of ovulation, because like I said, I'm a little bit of a nerd about (laughs) tracking ovulation and I'll literally talk to my husband and be like, well, I know I didn't ovulate this month, so this is why X, Y, Z is happening. And he's like, thanks for the information. (laughs) So, um, So just in general with ovulation, I feel like there's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about ovulation and what the importance of it is. Um, and I think this is an area where people that are taking the birth control pill are really not well informed because they don't realize that ovulation is shut down when they take the birth control pill. So, um, can you tell our audience a little bit about why ovulation is so important for women's health? Yeah, definitely. Oh my gosh, where do I begin? You know, like I was saying before, this is something that, you know, we have, we, we, tend to believe is 
an optional thing because of being on the pill. And the fact that, you know, so many of us have been on some form of hormonal birth control that's suppressing this really vital function um, is a real problem. And I love what our mutual friend, Dr. Lara Bryden says, where she talks about the fact that men would definitely not jump at the chance to turn off their testosterone. <laughs> Just wouldn't happen. And so as a result, um, you know, again, like from our cultural conditioning, we've just been led to believe that this is something that we can take or leave. And I, you know, I just refuse to believe that. And, you know, I think, and you know, what the research shows is that the first sign of any kind of underlying um, health issue is some kind of issue with ovulation and ultimately your menstrual cycle. So whether that's irregular cycles or you lose your period completely, or you start just bleeding constantly and you don't know why. And, you know, these irregularities are certainly a sign of something going on, right? So something going on with your lifestyle, with your endocrine system as a whole, whether it's, you know, your thyroid or there's too much stress or what um, possibly autoimmune issues. I don't know if people even realize this, but gluten, uh, if you have uh, celiac disease, sorry, I'm like gluten, celiac. If you have celiac disease, one of the manifestations is a missing period is you stop ovulating. And you know that I've seen that so many times. And when the person goes on a gluten-free diet and does some gut healing, they're able to restore their ovulation. So this is, you know, again, a sign that something is going on on a deeper level. I mean, like I said, genetic, possibly genetic issues or nutrient deficiencies. And so that's why, you know, when I think about the menstrual cycle, we've got this amazing superpower. We have this barometer of our health that happens pretty consistently on a monthly basis. And yet uh, we are hardly utilizing it. We scarcely even know what is going on with our menstrual cycle. I was just listening to this thing today. Somebody was talking about, um, it was sort of in the, sort of in the back of my head. Uh, it was a video that I happened to catch and she was talking about the fact that something like 45% of women who were polled in this recent national poll couldn't, uh, you know, name the different parts of the vagina. Um, you know, the clitoris, the vulva, all of these different, where the urethra was, they didn't know what all of those were. And I was just thinking, Oh my goodness, you know, this is sort of a, a far reaching problem because not only are we disconnected from this physical uh, aspect of our health, we're also disconnected from what's happening, you know, inside internally that we can't, can't even see. And that's really what we should be, you know, we should be engaged in a conversation with our bodies and understanding that, you know, this ovulation and having a regular period is a crucial part of your overall health. And, you know, that to me is a sign of optimal health when it's all happening consistently. Mm -hmm. And I feel like to kind of play off that, um, just lack of knowledge about the anatomy piece, I feel like there's also a big lack of knowledge around what is a normal period. And I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that before because I feel like so many women just assume that certain things that they're experiencing during their period is normal. And whether it's because they've experienced their whole lives or they talk to their sister or their mom or their friend and they're like, oh yeah, I feel that way too. That's normal. Just because it's common doesn't mean that it's normal when it comes to human and female physiology and functioning. So I would love to talk a little bit about what kind of symptoms in the actual menstrual cycle itself that women can pay attention to or look out for that could indicate the need to address hormonal imbalance. Yeah, I feel like this is a bit of a grown-up version of the talk <laughs> that we all got. So what I like to do is just talk through what I consider to be a normal menstrual cycle. Um, and then, you know, talk through a little bit about what, you know, what is not considered so normal in, for lack of a better word, uh, within the scope of the cycle. And so what I like to see with a period starting on day one of your cycle. So your first day of bleeding is your first day of your whole menstrual cycle, um, is a, a period that lasts somewhere between like three and seven days. And, you know, ideally four to five days is, is what I like to see. Um, again, sometimes three days is fine too. Six days is fine too. It just really depends on the person themselves, but anywhere between three and seven days, four to five days of bleeding is, you know, the kind of the optimal, at least for my clients. Um, and then for your entire menstrual cycle, uh, 
I really like to see that anywhere between 25 and 35 days. I know that the literature differs a little bit. And, um, you know, a lot of people say that 21 days is a good length of time too. But I've found that in most of my clients with those shorter cycles there, they tend to have shorter luteal phases. So like I said, I like to see 25 to 35 days in length and, you know, that's give or take about a month or so, a couple of days. And so then from there, you know, with your bleeding itself, you know, like I was saying earlier, you know, I had someone mentioning to me that they were losing about 90 milliliters of blood. You know, they're using the largest menstrual cup they could find. Uh, and that's in the first two days of their cycle. So 90 milliliters, the first day, 90 in the second day, that is not okay. That is way too much. And, you know, in ultimately really what you want to be looking for is about six, uh, you know, 80 milliliters max. Um, after 80, you're, you're considered a heavy bleeder. So I, you know, usually what I find is that, you know, women are changing their pads or tampons like three to five times a day in the first couple of days. And then it tapers off to a few times a day. And, you know, that's kind of what I like to see. But, you know, I think that when we're talking about these kinds of numbers, it's very difficult to measure menstrual blood loss because we're not losing just blood. We're losing tissue. We're losing fluids, um, clots. There's a lot of things going in there. So I always say, you know, again, check in with yourself. And when it comes to heavy periods, periods, those are really easy to kind of decipher, right? You know, like, you know, when you're bleeding too much, like if you are, you know, like I said, changing menstrual cups, uh, multiple times a day and, or changing pads and tampons, you know, five to seven or more times a day, and they're fully soaked or you're leaking through and you need uh, a pad or a tampon or both, um, or period underwear and a tampon, that's potentially a sign that something is up. And then also too, if you're passing clots that are larger than an inch if you're you can't get through the night and you need to change throughout the night or you need to have a towel on your bed and so you don't leak through your clothes when you're sleeping all of these are definitely signs if you have iron deficiency anemia and you're just completely wiped out from your period again another sign that you are definitely bleeding too much so hopefully that's helpful for people just to kind of gauge what you know might be going on with their cycle and then on the flip side as you know, um, you know, we can, we can have periods that are just too light. That mean that your estrogen is not building up to a threshold that's, you know, allowing your uterine lining to build, uh, substantially. And so what I find is that if we're bleeding for less than two days in a cycle, that indicates to me that something might be up, meaning that maybe you're not ovulating, or if you are ovulating, you're, you're just not, your hormones just aren't where they're supposed to be in terms of their levels. And so we have to just look at that and see what's going on there. Um, and the other symptoms, the symptoms of not bleeding a lot are period blood that's light pink or, you know, light red, and it's kind of watery and doesn't really look like actual blood. Uh, other signs include, um, you know, just changing a pad or a tampon like once or twice in your entire cycle or, you know, something like, uh, you know, you're just spotting and you don't really even feel like it flows. It's all signs that you're probably not bleeding enough. And the other things I like to look at as well. And I think that come up for a lot of women are spotting before your period. So a couple of days of spotting before your period, I don't consider to be a huge deal by any means, but when you get to three, five, seven, ten 10 days of spotting before your actual bleed, that to me indicates that something's up with your progesterone. So likely, more than likely, your progesterone is either dropping too soon because your progesterone holds your uterine lining in place. So it's either dropping too soon or uh, it's, you know, dropping at the, you know, it's like dropping in and out, like it's not high enough. And so as a result, you're starting to spot throughout that second half of your cycle, the luteal phase. So I feel like all of these kinds of symptoms are, are things to look out for. I think the final thing is pain. You know, again, talking about a normalization of a major problem in our society, which is period pain. Uh, you know, I just, I'm always in awe of the fact that for whatever reason, you know, we treat other parts of our body when they're hurting us, uh, in a way that, you know, indicates to me that we're concerned about them <laughs> and concerned that there, there is possibly an underlying issue. And yet when it comes to our uteruses, when they hurt, we ignore them or we're told to ignore it. And we're told that that pain is completely normal, or it's just a part of being a woman or having a menstrual cycle or getting a period. And it really just should not be that way. And so I always say that, 
if you're taking more than, you know, two ibuprofen, um, at, you know, in a cycle, then you might want to look at that. If your period pain is disrupting your life, you definitely want to look at that. You've got to start exploring and figuring out, you know, what could be contributing to this pain that you're experiencing. Cause I do not think it's normal. I do not think it should be normalized. I think it's almost always a sign of underlying pathology. It could be endometriosis. It could be a condition called adenomyosis. You might have a thyroid hormone imbalance, which triggers period pain. Uh, you might just be generally inflamed and your, your body is responded, responding in that way. So I think that there's you know, multiple things to be looking at when it comes to what we consider to be a normal, healthy period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like even things like mental and emotional symptoms could be thrown in there as well, because as we were, (laughs) as we were saying before, like having some mood changes is normal and not to be made fun of or scoffed at or anything like that. But if you're, and and I can let you explain, but I was going to say, like, I think there's a certain level of mood changes, anxiety, that kind of thing that would not be considered normal. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. I'm so glad you mentioned that one. It's, it's it's like the biggest thing, right? Um, when we're talking about the mood issues, I, you know, I always love the quote by uh, Dr. Christiane Northrup. She talks about the veil being lifted in the second half of your cycle. And uh, she talked about that in, in women's bodies, women, wisdom, women's wisdom, her Bible, (laughs) she has such a good book, but she, I loved it that she said this because it's so true, right? I mean, I've had so many women say to me, I just want to divorce my husband in the second half of my cycle. I'm done (laughs) kind of thing. And then the next, you know, the next cycle comes around and, you know, ovulation's occurring and everything's great. And so I think that it's really important for us to remember that not only is your menstrual cycle a barometer of your physical health, but certainly of your emotional health and your life circumstances and what's going on in your life in general. And what I find is that when there is dissatisfaction or frustration, or you're not getting what you want, or you're not getting your needs met in your life in various areas of your life or relationships are challenging. What I found is that like Dr. Northrup says, the veil is lifted in that second half of your cycle. It's like progesterone is truth serum or something. And we start to, you know, we feel this flood of emotion, especially when we feel so frustrated uh, in our lives. And, you know, I feel like estrogen is sort of a smoother over and it makes us all happy and we have the blinders on and then estrogen drops and progesterone takes over and things shift. And again, I feel like this is so important for us to be able to reflect during this time on what's happening in our lives. What do we need to do differently to show up different in the second half? Because this second half of your cycle is always going to tell you what is not working in your life, whether you want to know it or not. And so if we can use it in that way as a gauge for what's working, what's not, it'll shift. Like it definitely will shift. I've seen it a hundred times, you know, obviously there's a physical things as well as diet and whatnot, but I think our emotional health, like you were talking about earlier, Laura is so crucial to be able to differentiate, you know, what, what we need to change in our lives and, you know, what is working for us currently. Mm -hmm. And just to add my own personal caveat to that, I do think that with emotions, we want to use them to indicate things, but not to be like the main factor in our decision making. Um, Just because like, I mean, I've definitely had moments where I was feeling emotional or anxious or whatever the, the emotional symptom was. And my brain wants to make like you know, beliefs and ideas and stuff out of what that emotional state is. So if I'm struggling with something, I'm, my brain might be like, okay, I'm just going to give up on this. I hate this. This sucks. Like whatever the, whatever the, um, you know, the thought that comes from that emotion might be, I do encourage people to make sure that they're not like just saying, oh, well, I have this emotion about my husband, so I must need a divorce or something like that. So yes, I agree. Just, just making sure. <laughs> Definitely not encouraging that. Yes. So, but <laughs> no, but like you said, it, it can be an indication of like, maybe you need to have a conversation with your husband about something that's yes. not working. So <laughs> before the divor- divorce, right. yes, right. <laughs> definitely have the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I should have clarified that. I was more just along the lines of it just feels so heightened in this, in this phase of your cycle, right. or at least emotions do in many cases. And really a lot of the time it's that your progesterone is 
possibly too low and you're just really irritated because progesterone is a calming you know i call it the keep calm and carry on hormone like it really will do that for you but if you don't have it in the right amounts then yeah the second half of your cycle is not going to be fun at all and so i think for sure that if you are having these heightened emotions you 100 percent have to check in uh with yourself and work with somebody to try and figure out what's going on there oh yes absolutely <laughs> i should have clarified no, that. you're fine <laughs> Well, and I do think I don't want people going straight to divorce. It's like, oh, I guess that that's why I'm feeling this way. No, I'm kind of I'm joking. <laughs> but what I was going to say is that I think it's it's good to notice how you're feeling and then say, OK, well, maybe there's some changes that need to be made. And also, if you're aware of where you are in your cycle, I mean, this is how I personally think about it. Sometimes I will be feeling a certain way, feeling more reactive to things. And then I look at my little chart and I'm like, oh, I'm only a couple days before my period. I guess that would make sense that I'm a little bit more agitated by things. And I just find it actually to be empowering to say, okay, this emotion is not bad. I'm not a bad person for having the emotion, but it also might be a little bit more intense right now because of the time in my cycle. So let me just like write it down, like acknowledge how I'm feeling, but maybe wait until I'm feeling a little bit um, more emotionally balanced before I make any decisions from that experience. So I just, I like knowing what's going on. Cause I do think I, I tend to be a very emotional person, um, very like intense emotions. And sometimes, um, I've had to really teach myself how to not let those become something that drives decision-making, but rather just gives me feedback, if that makes sense. Definitely. Oh my gosh. I'm the same way too. It has been such a challenge to really rein it in and not let it completely take over all of my decision-making. I mean, because you certainly don't want to be making decisions in your life or uh, having conversations with people when you're in such a heightened state. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know you're an ambitious woman like I am. And when you run a business and you're trying to um, do big things in the world, there's probably a lot of emotions that we experience that the average person doesn't get exposed to. So it's, um, it's a blessing and a curse sometimes, but I will say that it's, it's good to just have that self-awareness of like, okay, what do these emotions mean? Is this like, you know, is this telling me something that is accurate or am I, am I making up something based on circumstances? So anyway, I love talking about mindset so I can always go in that direction if you let me. So, um, but what I think we could come back to is this concept of understanding where you are in your cycle and how you react at different phases of your cycle to just get to know yourself better and to get to understand your body, your brain, your emotions, that kind of thing. So what's the best way the people, the women listening can become period literate so that they can figure out if their period is normal or not, or even how to use their period as an indicator of what might be happening internally. I think that the most the easiest way to do this is to just start tracking symptoms. And that to me is on a base level, what every woman should be doing. Because like I said, you know, what tends to happen is we just don't get the answers that we're looking for from our doctors for the most part, just because, uh, you know, they're not really trained to do that, right? They're trained to give you a protocol for how to deal with your specific symptom. And that's usually a birth control pill or some other form of, of birth control, whether that's an IUD or an implant or something like that. And that really is the, the catch all, uh, solution. However, we, that doesn't work for a lot of people. So what I suggest is getting an app of some kind or using a paper tracking chart, which, uh, there are a few of them available on Amazon and you can basically just start with the first day of your cycle. So first day of bleeding, like track those symptoms, track how much you're, how much you're bleeding. Like I said before, so how often you're changing tampons or pads or period underwear, or your menstrual cup, and as well as, you know, track the color of your blood track the clots that you see as well as the pain that you experience or any other symptoms that are disruptive to your life like we were just talking about the premenstrual time uh, can be really disruptive and you want to make sure that if that's what you're experiencing 
then you have a record of it. You're collecting data about yourself because that will inspire much more conversation with your healthcare provider, your doctor, when it comes to figuring out, you know, next steps. For instance, if you, if some, if you have a lot of period pain and you need to figure out, um, you know, what the next steps would be to determine whether you have a condition like endometriosis, really, I mean, for most doctors, the protocol now is to have someone track their cycle and really figure out when they're experiencing this pain, uh, whether it's the lead up to their period, the first three, four days of their period, or at all other times in their cycle as well. And from there, you know, you can then start to take next steps to figure out further what's happening with your body and with your health. So I would say the tracking of your cycle, tracking of, their, of the symptoms it, during your period, um, in the premenstrual time as well, tracking those emotional symptoms that you're experiencing and the physical ones too. Do you do you have breast pain or breast swelling that's so disruptive to your life in the three to five days before you get your period? Definitely mark that down. Um, and then of course, when you're ovulating, you want to be tracking that too. So you want to be looking at your cervical fluid. And this is, I think, a bigger conversation than what I can talk about on hair. But just to give everyone an idea, you know, your cervical fluid changes quite significantly throughout your cycle. And I am a huge advocate for us looking at cervical fluid and figuring out, you know, what going on with your particular cervical fluid. So for everyone who doesn't know, it changes quite drastically starting from, you know, right after your period, you might have a dry feeling and dry sensation. And from there, it starts to sort of get a little bit wetter as you approach ovulation. And then as ovulation gets even closer, probably anywhere from like two to five days, that's usually what it is depending on your age and multiple other factors, your nutrition, all that stuff. Uh, then your cervical fluid will take on this wetter, stretchy, egg white type uh, you know, consistency. And that is a real big indicator that ovulation is imminent. And then from after ovulation occurs, once progesterone takes over, it literally dries up your cervical fluid. So estrogen is the wet cervical fluid hormone and progesterone is the dry one. And progesterone will uh, make it sticky or tacky or you'll just feel dry again like you did after your period and that's usually the case for most of the rest of your cycle until you get your next period there is a bit of an estrogen bump and you'll notice again cervical fluid sort of in the middle of your luteal phase uh, about a week before your period but aside from that um, you know that's really the pattern that you would be looking for and we can, we can look for those patterns in just in wearing dark underwear and making a note every time we go to the bathroom to check and see what, you know, what's going on with our cervical fluid. And like I said, this is a key component of your overall health as well, too, because changes in that are kind of weird or changes that you don't recognize could indicate something. It can indicate a bacterial invaginosis infection or a yeast infection. It could indicate something's going on with your cervix um, or another STI, for instance. I mean, it, it really is so important for us to be paying attention to that in addition to tracking our symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I spent some time reading up about the whole cervical fluid thing. I think it was like last year. And I just was kind of shocked at all the different things that it can mean, the different like textures and like why it's happening the way it's happening. So it's actually really cool. I know it's kind of like a weird topic to like get all geeky about, but um, it is something that once you actually discover what it means. And like, you don't have this like, oh, I, I remember reading it. I can't remember if it was Lisa Hendrick Hendrickson Jack's book or if it was the, um, oh, what is that one called? Taking Charge of Your Fertility. There's, there's a couple ones that talk about this stuff. And I remember them saying like so many women think that they have like a yeast infection or something because they have this cervical fluid. And it's like, no, that's actually totally normal. And this is what it means. So I just, I think it's, a little sad that we don't get taught this as young women so that we're not like completely clueless until we're in our 30s. But it is something that I know that um, there's a lot of awesome people, yourself included, out there in the world making this more known and making this more common knowledge than it has been in the past. And actually, that leads me to a little bit of a different question, but something I would love to hear from you, because um, I know that this is a huge passion of yours, and you've built your whole business around it, and you have a book coming out very soon from the time that this podcast um, drops. So I would love to hear from you. What is your big vision for the work that you're doing with just the period girl brand and all of that? And uh, what's the impact that you hope to have on the world through the work? 
You know, I think at the end of the day, and this is a really big goal, but it's that women have this information. Like you said, you think it's so unfortunate that we're not taught this before, you know, our mid thirties. I mean, how many times have you heard women say to you, Oh man, I wish somebody had said this to me like 20 years ago. And why didn't anyone tell me this? Right. I mean, it's really unfortunate. And there's usually so much regret and frustration and even anger based on the fact that we women have made medical decisions for themselves or other decisions. And it was on, on, it was based on uninformed consent, right? They didn't have all the information. And I really want women to have this information. That is my big, big goal. And that as many women as possible all over this planet, because when we have this kind of self-knowledge, I, I just think that it completely takes the mystery out of how our bodies work and it empowers us on a level that we likely never even thought was possible. And so I just think it's such a game changer to be able to track your cycle and understand your cervical fluid patterns and what's going on with your period and why, you know, all of these things might be happening with your period and that you can take actionable steps to fix those issues. Like you were saying before with the cervical fluid changes, you know, like, I used to be that person who was convinced every single month I had a yeast infection or I had an infection of some kind. When I would see that stretchy cervical fluid, I had no idea what was going on. And I was completely petrified, refused to ask anyone about it. I was just like, whatever, I'm just going to keep rolling with this and see what happens. And I know that there are so many millions of girls and women who feel the same way and they feel ashamed and they don't feel like they can talk about it or they can ask about it. And I fundamentally want to change that. Mm hmm. Well, I know that for all of us 30-somethings that are learning this stuff now, that if we have kids and we have daughters, I'm I'm hoping that we'll be inspired to um, inform the younger generation before, like I said, they, they spend 20 years being confused about things and not knowing any idea what's going on. So, um, but I, I love the message that you share and just the, um, you know, the whole idea of helping women become more period literate and just understanding what's going on with their bodies and being able to resolve issues that maybe they were told was just, like you said, their lot in life and that was the way it was going to be. And just understanding that, that's not the case. In most cases, you have a lot more control over it than what I think we're taught to um, expect or understand. And I just, I'm very grateful to have people like you in the world who are sharing this information so widely. Aw, thanks, Laura. Right back at you. I feel the same way about you. Oh, well, I do have one more question that I ask all of my guests. And the caveat is that there's no right or wrong answer. Sometimes <laughs> this question freaks people out. Um, but <laughs> In your opinion, what do you believe makes a person more than a body? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't even know what I have an answer for right off the top of my head. Um, I think their emotions and their heart and their spirit. I think that what you know, our ability to love and be love and receive love is what makes us more than a body. Awesome. Well, you had an answer. It came I right guess. out. <laughs> I don't even know how it just came out. I was like, wait, what did it just come out of my mouth? <laughs> <laughs> it was in there all along. Well, yes. I appreciate everything that you've shared with us today. And I know that we just barely scratched the surface of this whole topic. And um, there's going to be lots of women who want to know more and want to learn more. So where can they get more information from you on the topic of amen or amenorrhea, sorry, of <laughs> menstrual cycle function, and maybe some amenorrhea in there as well, but yep. just in general, um, getting a better menstrual cycle. So everyone can find me at my website. It's NicoleJardim.com. And I have an amazing blog full of a lot of information there. I'm also on Instagram, uh, Nicole Jardim and Nicole M. Jardim, like Madeline. And also I have a new book coming out. It's called Fix Your Period in addition to my Fix Your Period program. So I've got multiple options for people and trying to figure out what's going on with their own menstrual cycle. Book's coming out on April 28th, uh, 2020. And um, it has a six-week protocol for anyone who is struggling with any of the issues we just talked about, actually, and wants to address, uh, you know, their periods from a holistic perspective. That's awesome. I am just so impressed by the book writing. I was being very facetious <laughs> earlier when I said book writing is not that hard. <laughs> I've never done it myself, but everybody that I know that's written a book, it's, uh, I've heard it's 
quite the undertaking. So congratulations on that. I, I think by the time this podcast goes live, it'll be coming out very soon. So um, we will definitely put links in the show notes to Nicole's website and her book information so that everybody can um, go get even more informed about period health than they are after this podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Laura. I so appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Nicole. And thank you to our listeners for hanging out with us today. We will see you here next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Hey, everyone. Laura Schoenfeld here again. Are you one of the nearly 45% of female athletes who experience menstrual irregularity? Have you gone more than three months in a row without a period? If so, keep listening because I have a special training just for you. As a women's health expert and functional medicine dietitian, I've successfully helped hundreds of women recover their periods quickly with my evidence-based holistic approach. Whether they had hypothalamic amenorrhea, polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, or post-birth control syndrome. Seeing these women recover their hormonal health, get their period back, and even get pregnant was truly a joy. And I knew I just had to get this information out to as many women as I could. And I can't wait to share this truly life-changing information with you too. That's why I'm excited to share with you my free online video training, how to get a regular period without birth control. On this free training, you'll learn why any woman who wants to get her period back and get pregnant should not take the birth control pill. The single most important thing women must know about following the right diet if they want to get their period back and prepare for a healthy pregnancy. Why quitting exercise isn't necessary for period recovery, but you do have to have the right approach to working out. Why chasing weight gain or even weight loss is a total waste of time when trying to recover a normal menstrual cycle. You'll also learn five common myths preventing so many women from getting their period back so they can get pregnant naturally. And even their doctors are confused about these five myths. Also show you how to save time and money on your journey to becoming a mom and starting a family. And finally, you'll learn my proven four-step protocol has helped dozens of women get their periods back so they can get pregnant fast and without using risky medications. So if you want to get your period back quickly without resorting to birth control, quitting exercise, or giving up the healthy lifestyle that you love, then this free online workshop is for you. To get instant access to the free training, go to getyourperiodback.com. You'll learn everything you need to know about recovering a regular healthy period without giving up the healthy foods and exercise that you love. Check it out at getyourperiodback.com and I'll see you on the training.